We turn then to Acts chapter 14, and this morning it's my purpose to consider verses 8 through to verse 20. Acts 14, 8 to 20. I've given it the title, Chaos in Lystra. Chaos in Lystra. I've got written down here, a lot of Christians have an ejection seat mentality. As soon as they get into difficulty, they want to pull the ejection cord and zip off into glory, hoping to get away from it all. But you can't really base such a philosophy on what the scriptures give us. In fact, even as I read, the apostle is quite clear in verse 22, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. We must. It's what's involved in living in a broken world, we've seen that in natural catastrophe. It's what's involved in living in a world of broken people. We've seen that in the wickedness that was attempted in the tube this week in London. Where do all these things come from? Where, where is this great illusion, illusion of people are basically good? There are some good people about. Please, I don't mean to be negative, but... Where does all this wickedness come from? It comes from the fact that men and women are alienated from God and they need to hear the gospel. But they're not always willing to hear the gospel. And that's part of what we'll see as we look through this passage in Lystra. It does start off well, there's a remarkable healing. But then, to use the world's terms, it goes belly up. The very people who would bless and worship Paul and Barnabas turn in to their murderers. Let's look at the passage then. Chaos in Lystra. First of all, we'll look at the miracle, then the message, and then the malice. The miracle, the message, in the malice. As I said, verses 7 through 10 give us a fabulous picture of the power of the gospel and the way that through preaching, God, in fact, saves men and women. Let's remember that it's God's plan and intention to, to bring about the salvation of lost men and women through them hearing the word and that preaching is one of the main parts of it. It's not always popular today, but we must never get away. You don't convert people through gimmicks. You might get their interest. What people need to hear is the word of God. That can be a personal witness, but there's a much more efficient way, isn't there, if we get folks into a church building then we can speak to them as a group and bring to them the knowledge of the gospel. Chapter 14 and verse 7, when they left the previous city, it says, and they were preaching the gospel there. It means that wherever they went, they were proclaiming Christ and telling the world that they needed to repent, that Christ had died for sinners, that he who had died on the cross to make an atonement satisfying God's wrath against us rose again on the third day and commissioned the church to take this good news to the world. We're not given any of the details of what he said, but that phrase, preaching the gospel, is a picture in itself. Paul would write later, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then he would go on to say in Romans 10, how shall they hear without a preacher? So let's make sure we understand that you and I, whatever the world around us is thinking, hold fast to this principle that the word of God is for preaching. It's to be given to people. It's to be given so that they might hear and believe and live. That's apparently what happened here. We're not told about how the man was converted, but I would suggest to you that he is clearly converted and that Paul could see something of the change in him as he looked at him, and then he's healed. So often nowadays people put so much emphasis on healing, don't they? They have healing meetings and various other things, and they leave out the preaching. Let's get the order right here. They were preaching the gospel everywhere, and then the man was healed. That's God's sovereign purpose. That's God's sovereign plan. If he had only been healed physically, that would have been a further disaster. Because healing physically only results in, in, in extending life here on this planet. And who knows whatever tragedy or travesty 
might interrupt us. There were four people killed uh, on one of the motorways down south yesterday, weren't there? Tragic to hear about the, 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 what happens, but apparently a lorry came off one carriageway, crossed over and crashed into other cars. They were going about their business. They had plans for the day, but they never fulfilled them. The real thing that people need is to hear the gospel and through healing the gospel to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Paul would write later in Corinthians, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. We need to know that we are created in God's image to live forever. And if we're going to live forever, we need to be ready to live forever. Paul is quite clear. Whenever you poke your finger into the New Testament, you'll find that he was committed to preaching. At the beginning of the book of Romans, he says, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. And then at the end of the book of Romans, 15, 19, he says, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Lillicum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. That's who he is that's what he's about that dear friend is a picture of every Christian we're not all preachers we are all witnesses but you can certainly encourage the preaching of the word by making it a priority in your timetable in giving God that honor and place and glory which is his right and due if you go back then to verse 8 and in Lystra a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. It's quite clearly laid out. Does it call any parallels into your mind? We've been going through the book of Acts, haven't we? And way back in Acts chapter 3, you remember, as Peter and John were going up to the temple to pray, there was a man who had been placed there and was expecting <coughs> money from them but instead was given salvation and a whole body. He was lifted up. Some comment here that the, the, the description of what happens is more graphic here than it was in Acts chapter 3. Listen what said. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked and he leaped and he walked the words are recorded the, the, the incidents recorded and therefore some folks want to argue that what you have here is an eyewitness and then they'll remind you that Timothy was converted in this area Acts chapter 16 verse 1 Paul goes back and talks about Timothy who came from Lystra could it possibly be and I present it to you just as a thought <coughs> But what you have here is Luke recording what Timothy saw. It's very dramatic. It would have that kind of an effect on the people. And I'm sure when Paul saw this lame man and, and was led by God to, to, to respond to what he saw as a living faith in him, he would be remembering what had happened back in Jerusalem. Yes, there had been trouble from the establishment, but we're told back in Acts chapter 4, however, many of those who heard the word believed and the number of men came to be about 5,000. I'm sure Paul's every bit as human as you and I are and likes to see success. Perhaps the apostle thought if this man is healed like this, the drama will challenge the unbeliever, it will make them ask questions and perhaps they too will be brought to saving faith. What a day it must have been. What an excitement it must have created, as we'll see in just a few minutes. It actually created the wrong kind of excitement. But at that moment in time, I'm sure that as the apostle, I like the words here, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed. What must that have looked like? I wish he had taken a few more minutes to give us more details. But it's quite clear that that man who was a cripple from birth and had been sitting there unable to move, he had heard the word of God. Perhaps there's something to learn there. You don't have to be 
the strongest man on earth or the most beautiful woman or whatever parallel you want to, to be converted. You simply need to have your ears working and your brain in gear. And then we know elsewhere that for a person to have faith that that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that you need to be in that place where God is working. But whatever, Paul observing him intently, the word means looking at him with great, great detail. Was his face beaming? Was there a, a, an attentiveness so that folks were aware that no matter what else was going on, he was listening? From the pulpit, you see all sorts of different expressions in church. Some folk even manage to nod off. I don't know how that happens. But I can't tell you, I've done it myself. I remember a time when I, Sunday night, it was fatal for me to go to church. I would nod off. I planned I wasn't going to, but I did. And it's amazing how much of a difference there is going on. But the difference that really matters is the difference that the Holy Spirit effects. Because when He gets on the inside of us he convinces us that we're sinners he convinces us there's judgment coming and he's convincing us that the judge is righteous and so we we flee to christ even though we can't get up and physically walk this man has been dramatically converted he's god's great work there's been an encounter as he sat there and the healing of his legs, tremendous, fabulous. We all want the best of health because we imagine if we're in good health, then we'll be busy for the Lord. But is that the case? An old gentleman when I was a young Christian said to me, God puts us on our back to make us look up. Because when we are healthy and, 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 and our resources are good, we tend to look forward, to look down, Oh yeah, we'll give God the bit that's his. But when you're, when you're in weakness, you tend to look up. This man has been dramatically brought from death to life. He's been dramatically changed. Matthew 5, 6 came to mind. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This man had obviously been hungering and thirsting. And then as a bonus, can I say that word? He was healed. It's not always God's plan to heal us. You must be very careful of those folks who go around claiming to be able to heal. If their healing powers were as great as they claim, the hospitals would be empty. But in actual fact, they're overflowing, aren't they? Can't get a bed sometimes. God does heal. But it's according to his sovereign purpose and his sovereign will. You need to be careful and see though that it is God's purpose all the time to convert people. God is not willing that any should perish but the men and women should repent and believe the gospel and, and find everlasting life in Christ. That's this man here. We need to understand that and then just for the unbeliever let me ask you, why are you so indifferent to the gospel? Tremendous that you either come to church or you listen to this recording. But why is it that you are still not converted? You have something worse wrong with you. That's bad grammar, isn't it? Than this man had who couldn't walk. You are in a terrible condition and you need therefore to be saved. You need therefore to be delivered from this terrible state that you are in. The opposite of love, said one lady, is not hate, it's indifference. Indifference. Imagine being indifferent to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's going to happen now? Is it going to be like Jerusalem with 4,000 saved? I'm afraid not. What we find now is, is, is a real eye-opener, isn't it? 
Verse 11, now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes. That's <coughs> Jupiter and Mercury, if you're using a different Bible version, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. There's a history behind this. Apparently, in this city of Lystra, there was a, an ancient story, an ancient legend. The, the, this city, which was especially dedicated to Zeus, that Zeus had come for a visit and nobody paid him any attention except for one old couple and the result was that the whole city was destroyed and this old couple were exalted and became a priest and a priestess who operated the shrine that they're going to and the people from Lystra apparently lived in such a condition that they were always on the watch in case he came again and they didn't want to miss him. So when Paul and Barnabas turn up displaying such phenomenal powers, there's only one conclusion and that conclusion is that you now have a visit from Zeus and Hermes, from Jupiter and Mercury. Zeus is the head of the Greek pantheon, <coughs> Jupiter the same imaginary being, the head of the Roman pantheon. And what happens is they imagine they can exalt them. And how, how Paul responds, how Barnabas responds is where we need to go, you see. It would have been so easy to, to be carried along on the crest of the wave. To, to see this popular swell of tide to be something that, that God wanted you to ride on. Except for one thing, it would have been denying the reality and the truth of the living God. God. Verse 14, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes. You do know that's a sign of mourning in biblical times. And ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without a witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. This is a, a very instructive passage in that it displays to us, dear friends, the, the uniqueness of the Christian gospel. The uniqueness of the Christian message. In a day and an age when we're continually hearing that all gods are the same. They all live at the top of the same mountain. We just come up different roads and different sides. That's not what you find in the book. We've just sung, I am the way, the truth and the life. That's what Jesus said. No man comes to the Father but by me. Dear friends, let's be taught by scripture and be ready just to humbly and graciously correct those who are caught up in the delusion that all religions are the same. Paul is quite clear, I'm only a man. Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature to you. That again is a, a very instructive passage in the scriptures here. One of the great temptations for preachers is that people began to in, begin to inflate their egos and tell them how wonderful they are and how, how important they are to them. And we do see, don't we? We, we, we all know of famous preachers. There's a very delicate line, isn't there? Between recognising the gift that God has given somebody and exalting the man. 
You have to recognize the gift. And there are gifted teachers. And providing they, 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 they operate in that framework, there's no, no harm, surely, in recognizing that God is using them. But there's a whole sway of what's called Christianity where they are living in luxury. They have their own private jets. They're on the, the television medium so that people can see how successful they are. And we need to turn our back on them. We need to step aside from them. People are just very gullible, I think. And they think that if somebody is telling you God's blessing, then, then he must be. And that you should get on board with the blessing. My first encounter with him always sticks with me. A man called Creflo Dollar. You've probably seen him. I hope you haven't. But you might just have. And it immediately clicked in my head. How, how, how do you get a name like Dollar? And his argument, this is many years ago, it must be 20 was that when Jesus went into Jerusalem, he didn't ask for a used donkey to ride on. The donkey that he was going in had to be brand new, unused. And therefore, God's servants, they are entitled to more than the best because that shows that God is blessing them. What a mess. And yet, their church buildings are packed and ours are empty. Dear friends, it tells me as much about human nature as anything, doesn't it? Let's be clear that when you come here, whether it's me or Roy that's preaching, you will always hear that we are just men with an awesome responsibility. James says, don't desire to be many teachers, therefore, brethren, for there is the bigger responsibility. It's an awesome thing to stand and say that you're telling people what God's told you to tell them. But the glory is his. All the good that's done is his doing. All the mess, that's mine. And may God teach us from this. Let's learn from the sermon as well though. This is one of two unique sermons in the Bible. In this town of Lystra, you'll notice they didn't go into the Jewish synagogue. My brain was running ahead of me last week because I told you in the previous place there was no synagogue. It's this town that has no synagogue. That means there were less than 12 Jews there. They needed a minimum of 12 Jewish men to have a synagogue. So Paul proclaims the gospel to people who don't have a, a Jewish framework to put it in. He does the same in Acts 17. And as I read this sermon in Acts 17, I'm, I'm, I'm often... Provoke to think there are lessons here for us as we talk to the, the generation that we live in. When I grew up as a boy, everybody knew the Bible. Nowadays, well, I was on Radio 4 this morning, schools are being, um, what's the right word for it, challenged secondary schools because they're failing to include religious studies in the curriculum, and yet they must do by law. The Sunday program, I don't know if you ever listened to it on a Sunday morning quite depressing at times but it's a source of information we live in a day and age when people no longer know the scriptures the bible the message and if they think they know it it's a, a corrupted package so as you look here there's some instruction for us there's some help for us here look how paul approaches them first of all i'm just a man that's the miracle of the gospel church we have no priests we have no bishops we have no archbishops. We are all saints together, brothers and sisters in Christ, saved by grace and given gifts for different roles. We're just men. And when we make mistakes, remember that. Pray for us. We're just men. But get past that, you see. Listen to Paul. We also are men with the same natures as you and preach to you what? That you should turn from these useless things. That was not politically correct, Paul. That you should turn. That's a call to repentance. That's how John the Baptist began. That's my Lord Jesus' first sermon. Repent and believe, for the kingdom of God is at hand. 
That means, dear friends, bottom line, by nature, men and women are going in the wrong direction. And it's a disastrous direction. It's not just that they, well, they think differently. Let's be absolutely frank and clear biblically. When the gospel comes, it says to men and women, you are a sinner, and as a sinner, you're heading to eternal hell. What's to be done? You need to change your direction. Again, one of the great encouragements from Scripture is the ability to repent is a gift from God. When Christ ascended on high, Acts 5, isn't it? He did so to give repentance. And you and I need to be in our prayer meetings, praying that people's ears would be unstopped, praying that people's hearts would be changed, praying that there would be a hunger for the things of God instead of a hunger for, for the trivia of time. You should turn from these useless things. That's a very broad sweep, Paul. What do you mean? Well, context is use and Hermes, isn't it? Modern day Buddha. Isn't it amazing how many folk think the, the Dalai Lama is a tremendous man? And that Buddhism is sort of the, the, the respected religion of the unbelieving world. What's going on in Burma, Myanmar? Who's chasing those people out of the country? At the end of it, Buddhism is atheism. The ultimate goal of Buddhism is to go into non-existence, nirvana. It's a course of self-improvement. So we live in a day, my dear friends, when we need to be clear that while we are to show the utmost respect, we have no right to take up arms or anything against them, we are to stand firm on the scripture, turn from these things. And so the people of the world that don't know the Bible but know all about Star Wars, that's the other religion, isn't it? May the force go with you. I enjoy Star Wars. I grew up in that generation. But there are folks for whom it is a religion, isn't it? I'm old enough to have seen them all when they were first released. That's quite a confession. But we live in an age where we need a great deal of wisdom. And again, we need to be in our prayer meetings crying to God for help to know how to communicate it. This is a spiritual battle. The God of this world has blinded the minds. Think about it. It's not just that they need more information. They need a spiritual revolution, a transformation, so that they would turn from these things. And what we need to do is to tell them about the one true living God. There is only one God. And he has uniquely revealed himself in his creation, in his dealing with the patriarchs, in his calling of Israel, in his bringing about the, the death and resurrection of his son and his giving us the church and the world. And you will find, dear friends, that Christianity and all of that is uniquely different to all other religions. And, and, and here's the difference. Every other religion in the world, if you know the exception, tell me otherwise, but every other religion in the world says you must work to get in God's good books. Christianity says, listen friends, you could never do enough. But here's the good news, I've done it for you. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift, hallelujah, the free gift of God is everlasting life in Jesus Christ. The living God who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, there is one God, this is his world. I'm just conscious that time's against me here. I want to move down a bit. Who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. That, dear friend, is a very profound thought. Why does God allow all the trouble in the world? Because in his long suffering, 
He has a plan to redeem a people through the preaching of the word. He sent his son to establish it. And if I can use my language, he puts up with the junk. To allow the gospel to go to the world. He puts up with the junk who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own way. He allowed them to show themselves to be the sinners that they are. Think back, dear friends, about the horrors that are even in the, the, the memory lifetime of a, a group like this. We, 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 we're near enough to remember the Second World War. How did Adolf Hitler manage to persuade all those people to become the, the wicked murderers that they became? And why didn't God stop it? That's how the atheist talks, isn't it? Why didn't God stop it? Step back further into Soviet Russia when Stalin comes to the forefront and, and, and thousands are killed. No, millions are killed. I've skipped uh, uh, Tiananmen Square in China again. They, they, they sent the tanks in to mow people down. Why does God allow it? Because God has a purpose and a plan through the preaching of the word, through the life, death, resurrection of his son to, to, to call men and women from every tribe and tongue and nation to believe the gospel and come to faith. And to finish that work, he allows the wicked to show themselves to be wicked. None of them gets away with it. Some men's sins are judged in this world, Paul will say to Timothy later. Other men's sins go ahead of them to the judgment. Justice will be done. God will be seen to be fair. Because the whole world knows he exists. Verse 17, nevertheless he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Again, the question that pops up is, well, well, what about the people who have never heard the gospel? Have they seen the sun shining? Have they reaped the crops from the ground? Have they enjoyed the rain? We don't always do we, but it's God's gift just the same. That was the Saviour's word, wasn't it, Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount? God exists. The laws of physics may describe how he does it, but where do the laws of physics come from? Where do the laws of nature come from? I like listening to John Lennox. I don't know if you ever do this, I would recommend them to you. And people like John Lennox say, God is a mathematician. Because everything is constructed so it works and it works as designed. The world that we live in has no excuse. There will be nobody on the final day who said, I never saw anything to suggest that you exist. Nobody. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing them. Can you hear Paul give a big sigh of relief? Can you imagine being there with him on that very day? Oh dear friends, let's understand our business as Christians and as churches is to be always preaching the gospel and ready to, to, to challenge the unbelieving thinking of our generation we do need to be as sweet and gentle. It must never be given with offence. Be ready to give a reason for the hope that's within you, Peter writes. But to do it with gentleness. Find ways. Work on your temper. Find ways to make sure it goes out. And if you can't do it yourself, bring them to somebody who can. There will always be questions you don't know the answer to. Ask me later for my list. There will always be questions. But my job, your task, is to, to, to bring the gospel to the attention of the world. And then to send the world on their way thinking. 
I wonder what the group were thinking then. It occurs to me, he said, to ask, what does an unbeliever think after he leaves a gospel service? Sometimes, as in the parable of the sower, the birds just snatch the thoughts out of their brain, don't they? Sometimes the tangled weeds of time leave them so knotted they don't get time to think. But what should an unbeliever be thinking? He should be thinking there is a God and I'm going to meet him. He's given me clear testimony. The gospel makes it very clear who he is and I need to flee to him immediately. Robert Murray McShane, the, the hymn writer, the Scottish preacher of 150 years ago, once said to some friends, do you think Christ will come tonight? And one after another, they, they, they piously said, no, I don't think so. And when everybody had answered, he solemnly repeated this text, the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. When you think not. There's an urgency to the gospel, dear friends. And if you're not in Christ today, be in Christ before the day's out. Flee to him. His arms are wide open. Left without him, you might become like this crowd. Verse 19, then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. And having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul. And dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However... When the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. That crowd that was going to crown them turns into murderers. It's incredible, isn't it? But sadly, it's true. The frustrated Jews from earlier in the chapter, from Iconium, who've travelled the hundred miles to Lystra, are now in there and they're bending everybody's ears. They've got them on their side and they're going now to deal with these people. We know it was the Jews who, it, who were the driving force behind it because we're told here that they stoned Paul. That was a Jewish, an exclusively Jewish form of execution. They stoned Paul. So they must have got the people on their side. They were going to sacrifice him a minute ago. Sacrifice to him a minute ago. Now they're going to sacrifice him. Now they're going to destroy him. All together. The apostle's life was never easy. He must have lain comatose on the ground. Because we're told here they dragged him out of the city. What an indignity. Should have been buried. But no, he's just a common piece of meat. They dragged him out of the city. The injustice just comes across all the time. As Christians, sometimes you and I imagine that if we're in Christ, life's going to just be plain sailing. You're reading the wrong book if you think that. Three times I was beaten with rods, 2 Corinthians 11.25. Once I was stoned. This is it. Three times I was shipwrecked. And a day and night I have been in the deep. Writing in 2 Timothy 3, Paul talks about suffering persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Iconium at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Well, dear friends, I hope you're asking, was anybody converted at Lystra? Because the answer's in the text. However, when the disciples gathered round him. The mob going to exalt him and now murder him or think they have. But there are some disciples. You've got the man who can stand and walk now for instance, haven't you? And out of that furnace God has brought forth precious jewels. I wonder what they were doing gathered around. Do you think they were praying? I'm sure they were. Do you think they were looking to God for what should happen next? He rose up and ran for his life. No, he didn't. He rose up. God revived him. If you read commentaries, they've got pages of whether he was killed or whether he wasn't. It's not completely significant. 
God revived him. And to establish that he was still serving the living God, he didn't run away but went back into the city because there's something far more important than our own comfort, our own well-being, our own pleasure. And what is that? That the bride of Christ, the church, should be established and nurtured. That the witness of the gospel should be clearly stated. And that's exactly where the apostle is. He's ready to face the flag. He's going to continue being a witness. And dear friends, isn't that where you and I are called to be? Take up our walk daily, cross daily, and follow me. In China, during the Boxer Rebellion, I meant to check the days, late 1930s, wasn't it? The insurgents captured a mission station, blocked all the gates except one. And before this gate, they placed a cross flat on the ground. And then people were told, these were missionaries, that if they wanted to escape, they had to walk out by trampling on the cross. And apparently six or seven of them did. But a girl student said she wasn't going to do it. And kneeling by the cross, the book I was reading said, praying for strength, she went out to face the firing squad. Strengthened by her example, every one of the remaining 92 students followed her to death. It's far more important to make sure the gospel and the truth of the gospel is lifted up and given the place in society which calls men and women to faith and for you or I to have the comforts and benefits of a very short and brief life. Oh dear friends, this is a very challenging passage. I wondered how I would preach it when I began studying it. It's a triumphant passage. And I'll be finished then just with a call to the unbeliever. Following Christ is the best thing you will ever do. But it can also be the toughest thing you ever do. And here is the Apostle's testimony from Philippians, isn't it? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the promise. I need to stop. Time's gone. I hope you don't stop. I hope you keep on praying and thinking and asking God for the grace. I hope there's no mob waiting for us tomorrow. But if there should be, I pray that by God's grace we'll be equipped to hold forth the testimony of Christ. Amen.